This is a Global News special presentation. So many of us, when we were kids, we would always tell, I wish the Pope will come and see us. So we'll tell him to be so mean to us. Well, today I listened, I heard. In the face of this deplorable evil, the church kneels before God and implores his forgiveness for the sins of her children. The apology that was made was validation that that really happened. With shame and unambiguous, I humbly beg forgiveness. To hear the Pope apologize was very uh, emotional. I guess it, I'm having a hard time to uh, sometimes forgive. Begging pardon is not the end of the matter. I fully agree. That is only the first step, El punto de... the starting point. Quinn Oler, thank you for joining me on a journey towards reconciliation. Pope Francis mentioned a first step, and over the next half hour, we will look at the impact of his visit, his apology, and the steps needed to heal and move forward. But getting to this pilgrimage of penance wasn't easy. Canada's first residential school opened almost 200 years ago. It's believed at least 150,000 First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children attended until the last government-run school closed in 1996. Children were forcibly removed from their homes, stripped of their language and culture. Many were subjected to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Between 1986 and 1994, the United Anglican and Presbyterian Churches and the Catholic Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate all apologized for their role in the residential school system. In 2008, the Canadian government with its own apology. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. The government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes and we apologize for having done this. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed and in 2015 presented a list of 94 calls to action. Among them, a papal apology. After the discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves at the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, a delegation went to Rome a year ago, meeting the Pope at the Vatican, finally hearing those words. I ask for God's forgiveness, and I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. But that call to action wanted the apology on Canadian soil, and in July, Pope Francis fulfilled that promise. I am sorry. I ask forgiveness. The Pope apologized in Mascouchi. An emotional ceremony, the beating drums, a symbol of connection, the heartbeat of a community, of indigenous culture. But after years of waiting for that apology, in an instant, the Pope was gone. Past wounds left open, a community left to deal with the turmoil and trauma that so many have struggled with. The drums fell silent. Daintree Christensen went back to Mascouchi to hear their story. Eight months after the apology, after the gaze of the world moved away from this spot, residential school survivor Mary Munias returns to the powwow grounds where history was made. Does it feel any different now, though? For me, I feel, yes, I feel much um, lighter and freer. Back at her house, her grandchildren visit. They braid her hair before Munias goes to a ceremony. 
It is those ceremonies that have taken on a new meaning these last few months. One thing that you have noticed is that there are more ceremonies. Uh -huh. And what's that looking like? I see the more families celebrating in ceremonies with their youngest and their children. They're celebrating. I see more of that. The Pope's apology is going to help, will help our people, will help um, us start healing. The key word there, start. The papal visit was a, a very good start for a lot of us. And uh, it did offer our, you know, closure. Desmond Bull is the chief of the Louis Bull First Nation. He knew this visit would bring back painful memories of children ripped from their homes. He knew survivors would need support. The visit took a toll, but since then, he has also seen next steps towards reconciliation. Like a plan that would help bring children back to the community. Louis Bull reached an agreement with Ottawa to run its own child welfare system. How did you feel knowing that, you know, this is the first step into having child welfare placed back in the hands of the Louis Bull community? That was a very important uh, time for us. For me, it gave us the ability to, all right, now we can do the work in regards to bringing our children home. And we can't bring our children home until we fix the family unit. You know, we got to make sure the parents have the proper life skills, the parenting skills. And we got to do our end also in, in, our, in our community as leaders. It didn't really change anything for me. Others in the community, including Louis Bull's cultural advisor, Bert Bull, felt the apology offered little consolation. Bull says the church ruined his family and the church still has a role to play. If they're going to come together and assist in healing, then the welcome is there. And I texted us and said, go check on, go come. They said that this was the first step to healing. What would you say could be the next step? Education. I really want more people to go towards education. And the drum is a big part of the healing. It's the heartbeat of Mother Earth. It's the start she has long wanted on a path paved with an apology. Keep on walking, keep on walking. Now there'll be a change. Now there's a chance to make a difference in our lives. Daintree Christensen, Global News. The people visit and discovery of unmarked graves has taken an emotional toll on many. There is a 24 hour confidential national residential school survivor hotline. If you or someone you know needs help, call 1-866-925-4419. Well, throughout the papal visit, leaders all said this was the first step, not the last. So how do we walk together and what do those next steps look like? Stay with us. If he is willing to walk with us, then we'll be willing to walk with him. A show of mutual respect for culture and tradition, a symbolic gift from a Métis delegation at the Vatican in March of last year. Pope Francis welcomed the gift, acknowledging it as a sign of the suffering endured by Indigenous children and a reminder of the journey towards reconciliation. We want to walk together, to pray together, and to work together so that the sufferings of the past can lead to a future of justice, healing, and reconciliation. But what does that actually look like? How do we build bridges? What are those next steps? Here's Aaron Chalmers. Begging pardon is not the end of the matter. I fully agree. That is only the first step, the starting point. An apology with a promise. The Vatican chose this spot on Treaty 6 land as the location for this historic moment. The former Grand Chief says in the months since, whatever momentum was gained by July's visit has stalled. I'm really disappointed that Canada and the Church um, are not moving quicker. George Arcan Jr. says education is key. Teaching Canadians isn't an overnight process. We have some things to fix, and I think we know what needs to be fixed. We just need the tools to help fix that. Arcan says mental health supports for survivors must be in that toolbox. We are having a difficult time in providing the active uh, professional support they require. 
Indigenous leaders want more help from the Catholic Church, which pledged millions to residential school survivors in 2021. The 30 million that they committed, in my view, is, is peanuts, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, to what is required for us to start to build this infrastructure to make sure uh, we can deal with the mental uh, being of our people and our sp fix our spirit again. Overall, Arcand is satisfied with the apology from Pope Francis, an apology the Truth and Reconciliation Commission included in its calls to action. But he wants those calls to guide, not gauge progress. If all we want to do is, is do a report to say we're meeting the 94 calls to action, uh, that, to me that's not reconciliation, that, that's, that's purely checking off the boxes. Despite the lack of traction since the papal visit, Arcand remains optimistic. He knows Canadians are on a collective journey. The TRC report provides a path, and while we don't exactly know the destination, we do know it's a journey no one can do alone. My hopefulness is uh, that all of the leadership in across Canada will try to walk and be part of the solution, uh, but we need to begin that walk soon. Aaron Chalmers, Global News. In mid-January, the federal government and National Center for Truth and Reconciliation reached a deal that would see 1.5 million documents and high-quality images shared with the center. The Government of Canada is working with the Catholic Church to facilitate the sharing of their collections. Jennifer Wood is a third-generation survivor. She now works for the NCTR and believes releasing these records is important. I want to find my mother's records. I want to find my brother's and sister's records. I want to have something that I can leave to my grandchildren to say my people, my family went to residential school, they endured it, they're survivors and now they're thrivers. As for the Catholic Church and their role in continuing to walk this journey towards reconciliation, Aaron Chalmers sat down with Archbishop Richard Smith. Hello, Archbishop Smith. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Hearing from some people that have gone through residential schools or have family members that did, um, one thing for them to help heal is the records from these sure. schools. Sure. Um, some have been released, others haven't though. The church wants to make the records available because we want to help them tell their own story. And if the records that we have can facilitate that, then Yes, let's share those, of course. Uh, where there has been hesitancy in the past, my understanding is it might have had something to do with privacy laws that had to be navigated and so on and so forth. But the uh, underlying desire is how do we help? I know that this fund has been set up, um, a reconciliation fund of, I believe, $30 million. What is the process? Where, where is that going right now? The funds are pledged locally and they will be spent locally. In each diocese, as we have here, we are establishing a committee, Indigenous-led, and those that might think that perhaps they could benefit from the plans here, they would apply, and the uh, funding would be offered through a grant system. So I'm interested to know what um, feedback you have received from your congregation, from the Catholic community, um, with the Pope's visit and with the steps that the Catholic Church is now trying to take. I think there's first of all a sense of deep gratitude that the Pope came here. They, they could see for themselves the sacrifice that he was making to come to Canada to be with the Indigenous. And he made it very, very clear that this has to be a significant priority for all of us as we're moving forward. I've also heard from many of our people that they, they're admitting they don't really understand this particular history and so there's a call for more and more education. I know that you went to the Vatican. You've been very involved in this whole process. I'm sure you've heard many residential stories, more than most. How has it changed you? It has really um, highlighted for me the need to pause, stop, pay attention, and listen. Because if I take time to listen simply to hear the other, to allow their story to come forward. What I'm affirming for that individual is their um, unsurpassable dignity as a human person, as someone with a story, a story that matters, a story that needs to be told, and a story that, from someone that can teach me from their own experience. I need help, and I need to hear from 
my indigenous friends, the interlocutors as to oh, how they want to engage, what that looks like, and then discern together what the path forward looks like. Coping with the atrocities of residential schools, many are turning to traditional healing. How going back in time is helping some move forward. That's next. It's taken generations for the truth of what happened in residential schools to be recognized, and it will take generations for survivors and their families to heal. Healing in Indigenous cultures about leaning into the past to move forward, acknowledging truth and not forgetting what happened. For Danita Large, music is healing. Growing up, all I knew was that, yes, my dad went to residential school and others did, but I didn't understand the intergenerational effects. It wasn't until she went on her own healing journey that she discovered a truth even her father wasn't prepared for. We ended up finding out that he had two siblings that went to the same residential school that he did and they had died at the residential school. My dad didn't know about his siblings. His, his mom didn't talk about them. I can't imagine as a mother knowing that you already lost two children and then you're still sending two more. The discovery of 215 unmarked graves at the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, B.C. exposed frustration and anger. She went home and wrote Reconciliation Sky. Reconciliation Sky. Music has been a part of ceremony for Indigenous populations for thousands of years. I'm a former student myself. I spent seven years in Ermanskin. My family was implicated in the residential school from the inception to the conclusion. Lauren Green now works as a counselor in the community and notes ceremony was one of the things taken away. They were conditioned to, to betray themselves, to betray their teachings. Now he and his co-workers lean into their culture to help clients tasked with dealing with the emotional impact of the visit of Pope Francis. Our challenge as a service provider with Muscatrice Counseling is how do we meet those needs when those emotions come? And they do come and they have come. Those needs include connecting with the past, from pipe ceremonies to sweat lodges and smudging. Gary Lewis provides cultural support. When we actually light a, a braid of sweet grass or the pipe, or when we crawl into the sweat lodge, it becomes something Bigger. What did we have before, uh, before the white man got here, before the religion got here? Well, we had uh, native spirituality. There are barriers. Generations of damage can't be reversed overnight. We need to reconcile with ourselves and with our loved ones. That's what's going to move us forward. That's the work that Large is doing now. She says truth and reconciliation has to begin with truth. To be able to acknowledge the truth allows us to heal from the truth and it takes away the shame. Whereas if we just bypass it and try to jump to reconciliation, we're not really moving anywhere. We're just trying to move past it as if it didn't happen. There is support for residential school survivors and their families. A 24-hour confidential hotline has been set up. If you or someone you know needs help, call 1-866-925-4419. The next generation has inherited the impacts of residential schools. When we come back, we sit down with students to hear their journey through reconciliation and the Canada they want to see in the future. As the reconciliation process continues, it will be the next generation of Indigenous youth who will forge its future. Vanesh Pratap spent some time at Boyle Street Education Centre speaking with one teen whose father was in residential school about her aspirations, the present day challenges and what's driving her choices for her future. My name is Oceana Clark. 
I'm 16 years old. What interests you about political science? Mostly the representation for Indigenous people so that they have someone as like an example, I guess. Because I know when I see Indigenous people like on TV having like good jobs, I know that it motivates me. They just have to see that they are important. Do, do you think Indigenous youth now have it easier or even more challenging compared to a uh, generation before? There's the group that have all the support and the confidence, they're built up. And then there's the other group who have suffered and just seems like they just hang on to that and they don't know how to get out. Like if you were to make a mistake, the same mistake as like a different nationality teen, um, some of them wouldn't face the same consequences. And that's just how the system unfortunately works. What's your message to uh, Indigenous youth? Just having guidance from, you know, maybe elders in the community or other leaders in the community to guide them and encourage them and let them know that, yeah, they can do this. How do you deal with the, the reality of what happened in the past, the, the current path of reconciliation, and how do you take all of that and what does it mean for your life and your prospects? For me, my biggest inspiration has been my dad because he's went through so much. Um, and he, through all of that, he stayed resilient. And that's what's inspired me to show that I'm capable. We understand that in this special, we merely scratch the surface of this issue. It's our responsibility to keep asking questions and to hold those in power to account. We want to thank those who entrusted us with their stories. We know that this is a difficult subject that can open old wounds, but appreciate their openness, honesty, and willingness to move forward on this journey towards reconciliation.